Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. So it's been a little while since my last video. I have actually been traveling and also had a couple really bad colds, including one right now. I got my box of tissues here because I'm currently dealing with a pretty crappy head cold. So I don't want to stop the retro computer love. So I wanted to talk about something that's really got me quite excited. Behind me, under all this bubble wrap here, is some stuff that I recently brought back from a trip I was on. I was lucky enough to go to London, England on a business trip for my day job, my other job, and I decided to buy some stuff while I was there, bring it back with me. I filmed some unboxing videos while I was in England, so let's take a look at those and then we'll get back to the lab in a second. All right, hey everyone, another unboxing from London. I ordered this awesome printer. I'm so excited. It's a Sagem photo. You know, okay, it's not. I, I, this is something else that came in the box. So let's open this up. Got my scissors here. I'm actually a little worried. It's a small thing, but this is relatively heavy, and I'm not sure how much packing material is in here. A whole bunch of glitter. All right, so this should give away a little bit of what I got here because I've got some tapes, some cassette tapes. So in the mini box here, and here we go. There it is. So it's a Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Very, very popular computer here in the UK. It's a little rough and ready. This one is not super great condition. It's obviously well used. I appear to have some kind of printer with silver paper. Don't really understand that. We have a power brick. Power brick for it. So UK plug, of course, I can't use that. But actually, this makes it really easy because I can just look up the voltage this puts out. Probably something like 9 volts. So I'll just replace this with a, with a US version. The seller also sent me some books. ZX Spectrum, here's the actual manual, which is kind of cool. Printer instructions and something else. And then we got a whole assortment of tapes. And look, this is like someone's the micro user mini office. Word processor and database. This is actually for the Spectrum or for something else. Spectrum. Look at that. Six great games in one! Computer Scrabble. Got the audio cassette there. 48K required. This is a 48K Spectrum. So all of these uh, games should work fine on there. Cosmic Combat. So I'll be very curious to see how well this works. I've never uh, used one of these before. I have a ZX81 at home. So the old original black and white version. But this thing... Uh, will be very interesting. So there we go. There's my next little project, ZX Spectrum. So I have my BBC Micro Model B, and I bought this off eBay. It had a ship to the office here. I'm working in our London office. This computer is a little dirty, a little dusty. As far as I know, it does work, so it definitely needs some cleanup. I'm pretty excited. Looks like it's in pretty good shape. There's a couple chips in the case. This is a package that just arrived here at the office, and I actually don't know what's in this. Let's unbox this, take a look inside. So the reason why I ordered two of these, the first one looked to be a little rough condition, and since they're so impossible to find in the US, I figured I would just buy two, and that way I could, I could put them together and make one really nice condition machine. And this one does appear to be quite nice. So the keyboard on this one looks really clean. The computer itself is absolutely filthy, but I wonder why there's this cutout here where the power supply is visible. Because on the other BBC, it doesn't have that. But this doesn't look like it was cut. That looks like it came that way. So I'm not quite sure what exactly is going on there. But it's quite amazing how clean the keyboard looks. This thing looks almost brand new while the whole computer itself looks a filthy mess. And we look at the back, and this looks slightly different as well. Kind of get a view in there. But when you push down the case, it bends a little bit. But overall condition, eh, it's not great either. 
but it's better than the other one. But anyway, so, so there we go, two BBC micros to bring back to the US so I can make myself one really nice machine. So as far as I'm aware, everything made it back to the US without incident. Let's get this bubble wrap out of here, take a closer look. All right, so here they are, all three machines together. Now, first of all, I want to talk about why I even got these. It's basically impossible to find the three of these computers in the United States. The BBC Micro was sold apparently very early on, very limited numbers in the US. It was an NTSC machine, apparently had compatibility issues because of that. I've never actually seen information on the US version. So because of that, I decided just to buy them in the UK and bring them back. They're inexpensive there, and I bought two, like I said, in my unboxing, because I figure that I can mix and match the parts of these to make one good machine. I really have no idea if either of these work. And then onto the ZX Spectrum, same thing. This was never sold in the US. It was extremely popular in the UK. They did sell a Timex version of this in the US. It didn't look like this. It was silver color. It was bigger. Also had compatibility issues because it was an NTSC machine, and this is a PAL machine, obviously. But I figured I was going to buy the original, the most popular one that, from the UK, which is the small one with the rubber keys and the rainbow. There were later versions of this in the UK as well, with more memory or a larger size, extra ports, things like that, that were relatively cheap as well. But I just saw this one on eBay, and it was cheap, so I grabbed it. As far as what works here, this machine actually had pictures on the listing of it working. So I know this works. This one had no information on whether it works or not, and nor did this. So these two computers could be broken for all I know, so it'll be an interesting project to try to fix those. So while I was in England, I was staying in a hotel that had a very modern LCD flat screen TV. It didn't have any SCART inputs. It didn't have any RF inputs on it. It did have composite, but I didn't have any cables with me, so I really had no way to even test these. I did plug these two into the power, and they both turn on. In fact, the one that supposedly worked, which is this one on the left, makes the normal beep sound. The keyboard lights work. This one makes the beep very, very faintly. It's almost impossible to hear, And but the, the lights do work on the keyboard here. You push the caps lock and the shift lock key, and these lights come on and off. So I don't know if these lights working means anything, but either way, they both seem to work at least that regard. I didn't even try the ZX Spectrum. This does only have an RF output. There was absolutely no way for me to test this, so I didn't even bother plugging it in. I was doing a little digging online to try to figure out a little bit more about these computers. I haven't opened them up, so I don't even know what's inside. But from what I can understand, when you look here where it says British Broadcasting Corporation Microcomputer System, this allows you to tell what issue the computer is. And I think by issue, it's like a revision. From my very limited knowledge, there were perhaps issues one, two, three, four, and also an issue seven machine. And the issue seven machine was the later ones, obviously the higher number. And instead of saying BBC microcomputer here, it says British Broadcasting Corporation. So I think this is probably an issue seven machine. We're gonna have to crack the case open and take a look inside to know for sure. This machine here, besides being really dirty, has a few little cosmetic issues. This dark brown plastic here just appears to be a sticker and there's a little bit of a kind of a raised section here and there's a chip right there missing from the plastic. I think this plastic is literally just stuck onto this cream plastic so it may be something I can buy a replacement of but I'm not too worried. The other one has no issues like that. There's also a little chip here which actually incidentally I found it came off in the packaging so I saved it so I could potentially fix this with a little bit of glue. When we take a close-up look at this machine with the chip it's pretty dirty, the keyboard doesn't feel very good either, it's sort of scratchy key presses. The other computer here, the one with this strange hole where the power supply is, I think this is an earlier machine, and we can tell by looking at the badge here. See it says BBC Microcomputer, as opposed to it all spelled out. Uh, I read online that it had something to do with the fact that BBC is copyrighted in other countries, so they couldn't sell this anywhere outside of England while it said BBC, but that may not be correct information. I, I don't really understand how this keyboard looks basically brand new. Like it doesn't even, I mean, there's not even any dirt on it. So I don't really get what's going on there. It, it, I think it's used because some of the keys have, you can tell where it's been typed on, but it looks really good. But this hole here is just an absolute mystery to me. I was taking a close look here and it doesn't seem like someone cut this. It looks more like this was manufactured this way. 
So perhaps this is an aftermarket top cover. It seems to have a much rougher grain texture on it than this one does. This is sort of a smooth plastic. Meanwhile, this is very rough, but why would there possibly be a hole here for the power supply? Maybe it's for ventilation, but wouldn't there have been slats in this power supply? So if you have any idea what might be going on with this top cover, let me know in the comment section below. Now the ZX Spectrum here I bought, this was really inexpensive. It didn't say if it worked or not, and obviously this was someone's old computer. And man, is it dirty. It doesn't really come across in the, in the camera that well, but it's really, really filthy. It's got glitter all over it, so um, that's weird. But it has also scratches like this here, I think is a scratch in the black plastic. And it also has a dent right there, so something obviously dropped onto this at some point. I don't know if this could possibly work, but check out the screws. There's a little bit of rust on those, so that's not a good sign. Uh, I haven't opened this up yet, so I just don't know, but this machine's obviously had a rough life. So I'm really dying to open up the two BBCs and check out what's inside. I know it was very common for people to put modifications and extra ROMs and stuff on the boards. So I really want to see if either of these have any additional ROMs or the disc controller chips or anything else that's going on inside. So let's crack these two open. I'm going to put the ZX Spectrum to the side. We'll look at this in another video. But today we're just going to take a look inside these machines and see what I can see. Let's take a look at my older revision BBC, the one with the strange hole here. It's got a nice complement of ports right on the back, including the Econet, which is sort of a type of networking that these machines came with. It's pretty cool. My other one doesn't have that. I think this was optional. There's an analog input, which I think is typically used for joysticks. There's a cassette port, RS-423 port, some kind of a serial. RGB, although there's a red line crossed over that, so I hope that doesn't mean it's broken, but this machine might not work. Anyways, video out, which is a BNC jack. UHF out, so this will be the RF out, not compatible with TVs in the US anyways. The built-in power supply, which I heard I can open up and modify so it runs on 110 volts, 110 to 120. And strange, as I pointed this out in my unboxing video, is there's a big gap here where, I don't know whether it's for ventilation or wires to come in and out of, but when you push down the case, it, it bends. The other one has a little extra structural support here, plus sort of a the way the plastic is molded, you can't just stick your fingers straight inside. So maybe the old, earlier ones look like this and the later revisions had that extra support for when you put stuff on top of the case. I gotta say for a 1981 p computer, this thing has just the most amazing expansion capabilities. Under the machine here, there are tons of extra connectors for more expansion. So something here is called the tube, which I think is for connecting secondary processors, like the original ARM processor was a development board, I think that would work on this through this interface, or a second 6502, or other types of processors, Z80, stuff like that. So that's what the tube port is used for. It's a one megahertz bus connector, which obviously some other kind of expansion, a user port, a printer port, floppy drive, disk drive port. This is 34 pins, very similar to what a PC would use. I think you can use a GoTech here. I am concerned there's an X there as well, sort of like on the RGB port, so maybe this port is bad. And right here is a power output port, which as far as I understand is driven from the power supply, and perhaps if you have external floppy drives, you connect to this and the floppy cable. You can have outside the computer, you wouldn't need a separate power supply. Cool here is it says Industrial Design by Alan Boothroyd. Probably mispronouncing your name, sorry Alan. Assembled in the UK, that's pretty sweet. It does have a serial number sticker here. I know a lot of these apparently are missing these. It says AB Electronic Systems 140,022. Plus a sticker here it says much, maybe it's Welsh? Something Technics Limited. And a service number. So perhaps this was serviced at a computer store, or maybe this is some kind of a safety inspection sticker. If anyone knows what this is, you can put a comment in the comment section below. All right, so let's see if I can open this thing up. I'm gonna take out all the screws that I can see and hopefully that opens the case. Those two went into plastic. Ah uh, yes, I can see it's already a bit loose on that side. So I imagine that these two probably take care of the back. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is the inside of a BBC Micro. First time I have ever seen this with my own eyes. So there it is, interesting. Now, right off the bat, here's that weird hole. Look at all this glue that's on here. So I surmise there was probably some type of plastic 
cover here and it was attached with some adhesive and over time it broke off. That's what we got there. So perhaps I can 3D print something to fill this gap and try to find some creamy colored uh, spray paint to fill that in. So looking inside the computer here, it's pretty darn dirty. Uh, but this keyboard is so oddly clean all over. But I think it's been cleaned. It just looks like someone gave it a good clean job at some point. I found this nut right here. It was just lying inside the case right there. And it looks like it was from this spot here. There's a matching one there. So taking a look inside here, it looks like it's in all right shape. It's uh, an issue four computer. It says issue four right here on the motherboard. Ah, it looks pretty good though. Got the Econet populated here. I think that's just not populated on my other machine. Has space for a reset switch here, but there's no hole on the back uh, through the plastic, but has the spot on the motherboard. It's definitely a little cruddy, dirty here, but it's probably from just crap falling inside the case its entire life. A lot of dust here and there. The composite output doesn't seem to be connected to anything. There's these two wires. They're just sort of here, these green wires. I know it's a common mod to connect this to something else. I think you need to put a capacitor in and you get color. Otherwise, it's a monochrome output. I'm not sure what's going on there. We'll take a look at how the other computer looks. But luckily there seems to be a good amount of information online and I can probably just re-solder these onto the connector if I need to for testing. From a ROM perspective, I am not sure if these two sockets over here are normally populated, but they are unpopulated. But over here there is one extra chip that has a sticker over it. It looks like an EEPROM. Assume these are just standard. This is the ULA, Uncommitted Logic Array. Is that what that stands for? It's got a heatsink and it gets hot. I really know so little about this machine, but I think this is a Ferranti part and it just runs really hot. So it's good that the heatsink was on there. These wires here are the power rails. It runs 5 volts to these three locations on the board. And then there's a little blue wire here off the power supply that is negative 5 volts. Now really though, this is a plus 5 volt board. So we're looking to look at the RAM chips. There's 16 of them. So here's 10 and there's another 6 right here. We look on this board, it's just a random assortment of things that are socketed and things that aren't. So I don't really understand what's going on with the RAM, why some of it is in sockets. I wonder if there's been a good number of repair. But clearly with these, these wires here, there's something been going on inside this computer. All right, here we have the other machine, the one without the hole on the top. So this will be an issue 7 from my understanding. Looks the same on the bottom. There is no serial number here, but I think that's pretty common that these stickers come off. So let's pop the cover of this baby. Well, here we are on the other machine, and uh, yeah, it's actually an issue four as well, so no real difference. That's good for me, though, because that means totally interchangeable parts between these two, so I can hopefully make at least one fully working computer. The two keyboard modules I have look identical other than the filth on this one. It kind of has white keys underneath there. I wonder who makes this. But it seems to be somewhat mechanical. Got a PCB back here as opposed to some kind of membrane. It does say Acorn Computers. 1981 there. Strangely, this one has a little speaker grill held on by these pegs. The other one doesn't have that at all. The speaker's in the same position otherwise, though. All right, so keep in mind that this is the working computer, but check out this funky-looking corrosion here. I wonder if that scratches off. Stuff here. Oh, look, it just scratches away. So that's just some kind of a dirt. I wonder if this got exposed to water at some point. There's a lot of unpopulated chips down here. There's also nothing here, which I think on the other one was the disk controller chip. And there are two less ROM chips here as well. So I wonder if uh, the other one is equipped with the floppy drive and the disk file system ROM that needs to go with it to control the disk drive. This board has entirely soldered RAM chips that are not socketed whatsoever. And the composite output is properly connected to the motherboard. So at least that kind of shows me how it should be connected. So I don't know why on the other one it was ripped off. Maybe someone dismounted the board at some point and they never reconnected those wires. Econet's not populated but we knew that. I'm not going to use that anyway so it's really no big deal. So these are the power supplies from the two BBCs and they both seem about the same to be honest. They're both Aztec supplies. They both are made in 1983. This one is the 42nd week of 83 and this one is the 50th week so almost the same. Switching power supply designs pretty cool for the time. I think the really early BBC micros had linear with a big transformer in here and they got very really hot. Well, this will be a lot better and more reliable, clearly. So I'm going to need to try to switch these over to 110 volts and then give them a test. So the capacitors on these two supplies look really good. And I found from my experience, I have a lot of old computers from the early 80s, is capacitors from the early 80s are very reliable. It wasn't until 
electrolytics in the late late 80s and into the 90s where they started getting unreliable and then we had a real problem in the 2000s with really bad caps but these ones probably all work reliably what does go wrong though is these paper filter caps these do crap out this one looks okay i don't see any cracks in it but i've had lots of these go out on power supplies and lets out a horrible smoke so i could have i have a new supply of these so i can quickly pop that out and replace it strangely enough this one doesn't have that paper cap it's using this type in the same spot the design of the pcbs is exactly the same between these so i guess some of the components are just interchangeable it does have a replaceable fuse right there on the fuse holder so that's pretty nice and it may be hard to see but it looks like there is some provision here for a voltage switch it says 115 volts and 230 volts and there are some holes there so i'm going to dismount the PCB from this chassis here and take a look what's on the other side and see how that's wired up. From what I understand, I've read that you just put a jumper in there, like a little strap between those two pins, and it will wire in a voltage doubler, which should enable this to work here in the US. Okay, here's the power supply removed from the chassis. And just in case you're ever working on one of these, make sure you, before you touch the bottom here, you short out the capacitors on the bottom, especially the ones on the high voltage side, which is this side. These can hold a real wall up, especially if you're in a 240 volt country. So I've gone ahead and replaced these two paper caps with newer modern replacements that won't let out this horrible smoke. One's a 0.22, which is this one right here. The other one's a 0.01, which is that one right here. And then on the board, I have strapped together those two pins. So see, I wrote 115 volts there. We flip it over. There we go. So I've joined that all together. And I'm going to plug this in. And we are going to see if the magic smoke is going to come out. I'm not going to connect the computer to it. I will run it first with nothing. All right, so I'm ready, I'm ready for testing. I bypassed the switch for now because I haven't rewired the original cord. But I have just connected a US cord. It's very unsafe. It's not grounded, so I'm not going to touch this. I have the ground leads not connected, but I mounted the board back in the chassis just in case it shorts out. I will be wearing safety goggles before I test this out in case this thing pops. We have the multimeter here for doing a little testing. So first off, let me put the safety goggles on. Okay, so I'm going to plug this into this power strip over here, and I'm going to keep it off. So I will be using the switch that is on the power strip. And here we go. I'm about to turn it on. Will it pop? Okay, no weird noises. So let's take these test leads and let's see if there's any voltage that is being generated here. Should be 5. 5.18. Look at that. It's working. And this blue wire here should be negative 5 volts. So let's get on the ground there. Test that. Hmm. Well, that's weird. Wonder why that five volts, why that negative five's not working. So there's three power rails. I'm just going to test them all here. First one is working. Five point one. Five point one. I'm not sure if these are just common together. They might just be common. If that's the case, <laughs> no point for me to test here. 5.1. So there's some kind of a problem with the minus 5 supply. I'm going to probably pull this board out and I will take another closer look. Okay, try number 2. There was a broken, there was a bad solder joint on this regulator here. So I have fixed that. Let's see if that fixed the minus 5. Let's turn this on. I don't have it in the metal chassis since it didn't blow up last time. So far no blowing up. Okay. Let's test out the negative five, so here we go. That made absolutely no difference. Okay, here's the other power supply. I put the same strap on there. I didn't need to replace the caps. This doesn't have the paper type on it, so we're good to go. So let me turn it on. No smoke. Let's check the five volt rail. Five point oh oh seven, looking good. Right, so let's check the minus five. Yeah, minus four point three three nine. So 
The other power supply definitely has a fault when it comes to the minus five. All right, well anyway, so this is working enough that I can put this back in the BBC and we can actually test one of these and see if it works. Okay, so power supply is precarious, but connected. Uh, the motherboard is interesting because it has marks like zero volts for ground, BCC3, BCC2, and BCC1 for the five volts. And then over here on this part of the motherboard, that's where the minus five connects. There's a single wire there. I have the composite output with the BNC adapter connected to my HDMI SCART converter, which has a little bit of a mod, so I can just do composite in very easy, so it's right here, no signal. We have the 120 volts connected to the power supply. Switch is bypassed, so I'm going to use this switch here on the board. So when I hit this, we're either going to get smoke, or we're going to get a working computer, hopefully with an image. Pal, we have a cursor. So I have a flashing cursor up on the screen here, but nothing else. So that's good, I suppose. Let's turn this off and on again. Maybe the keyboard needs to be connected. Like I said, this was the this was the computer that did work, and uh, it made a beep. I couldn't plug it into a monitor, so when I turn this back on, let's see if it makes the sound now that the speaker's connected. Okay, and look at that, BBC computer, oh yes, thumbs up, so at least one of these is working to some extent. So the voltages are looking okay on this particular power supply, the other one's not giving out minus five, but let me just transfer this over to the other BBC and see if that one's working, let me just turn this off and on real quick. Yeah, that's, that works as normal. Cool. All right, so same power supply, the other computer and the other keyboard. I'll connect it up. Let's see what happens when I hit the power switch. Okay, <laughs> I just realized monitor's not gonna work because the video cable is not connected, but the sound chip initialized. We heard the sound, so not sure why I wasn't hearing it when I tested in the UK. Although maybe this power supply was from the other computer. I can't remember which power supply was from which, but let's connect the video and I will see if we have some picture. <laughs> Alright, try number two on the second machine. I've resoldered the wires on there. Here we go. Wow, it works as well in Acorn DFS. So disk file system, I think that stands for. So this definitely has the disk controller ROM in there as well. <laughs> oh man! Thumbs up! See if how this types. I think the keyboard's gonna need a little cleaning. Two key doesn't work. Yeah, two's not working on this one. Okay, well, so the keyboard, while it looks very clean, it is not fully functional. So one of the cables I got included with this was this SCART. I think this is the SCART cable for the BBC Micro. It came with one of the two computers, so I'm gonna test this out because I can use SCART on my little converter box and we'll see if I get RGB color out of this one. This is the one, this one had the X drawn over the RGB connector. Okay, the RGB is connected. I unplugged the composite, so let's see how this works. Oh, yeah, that works too. Oh, it looks really sharp too. Well, I think I'm going to stop for today. Both these computers are working, and that has me really excited. I really wanted to just test them out today and see if the power supplies could be modified for working in the US, which I was able to do. So at this point, I have lots of cool stuff ahead of me to work on with these machines. You'll be seeing some future videos with more on these computers as I clean these up and get these fixed up and working really well. And I'm also going to make a video where I test out the ZX Spectrum, see if that thing works, and then clean that up as well. So I'm looking for suggestions and tips on what I can do with these computers, how I can modify them, make them better, of course hook up devices so I can play games and stuff on them. So definitely put those suggestions down in the comment section below. You can subscribe for more videos. I'll be making more on these and the ZX Spectrum in the near future. Thanks for watching, and I hope next time I'm over this cold because it's really annoying. <laughs> All right, take care. Bye.